Hello from the Houston Zoo, a hub for important conservation efforts around the globe. I'm Rachel McNeil. And I'm Andy Sirota. It's not just animal experts saving species, it's every family that walks through these gates. In the past few years, we've shown you how Houstonians who come to the zoo are saving gorillas in Rwanda, as well as lemurs in Madagascar. And now a new journey, a mission to save animals in another part of the world. KPRC's Justin Stapleton takes us on this adventure down a massive river and through dense rainforests and discovers a growing number of women leading the charge to keep wildlife from going extinct. This is Borneo, the third largest island in the world. The river and rainforest are filled with incredible wildlife but all of it is at risk of vanishing. Tonight, KPRC and the Houston Zoo take you to Southeast Asia for close encounters with animals that need our help. There's a lot of human wildlife conflict. Learn about the biggest threats and meet the people working day and night to make a difference. We've noticed that there's a lot of female researchers there. Uh, I know, see the smile on your face. From around the world, hear the call for action before time runs out to save animals you know. Losing orangutan forever, no, it's not an option. And unique creatures you may have never seen. It's like a dinosaur. They really need our voice. KPRC Channel 2 and the Houston Zoo bring you this special presentation. Keep it rolling. We'll find some good stuff next. Saving wildlife from Houston to Borneo begins now. More than 9,000 miles from the serene landscape of the Houston Zoo sits a few weathered buildings hidden in the middle of a jungle. Once abandoned, a professor stumbled on the site and got to work transforming them into one of the most important research and conservation facilities in the world. Welcome to the Donogarong Field Center. It's nestled in the Bornean rainforest just feet from the mighty Kinapatangan River. This is our first stop on our Bornean adventure. Our first stop after more than 50 hours of travel by car, four planes, a car again, and then boat. We checked into the field center, not knowing exactly what we were getting into. Hi. We found a place buzzing with life and laughter. And the females will stay with the, with the mom in the group for a while. A land where wildlife roams free. The full magnitude of Borneo's wonders on display, but across the island, all is not wonderful. The survival of entire species is at risk. Borneo is in Southeast Asia. Part of the island belongs to Malaysia, part Indonesia, and part to the tiny nation of Brunei. We're on the Malaysian side in Sabah, a place that attracts tourists and wildlife conservationists, all hoping that it's not too late to save this region. Once you know the wild elephant, you can't just stop, you know, and you, it, it feels very important to be the voice for them. Nurse Farina Othman, who goes by Farina, mother of two and PhD student, is the voice for elephants in Borneo and she has a chorus of support from the Houston Zoo. The Houston Zoo's Vice President of Wildlife Conservation and the Director of the Donogarong Field Center both knew from the time they met Farina, she had the drive and determination to make a difference. It's always an uphill battle in wildlife, but um, people like Farina and her team and other partners that we have are the ones that we rely on to help pull us forward. She wants to work more on the human-elephant conflict, mm -hmm. work with the villagers, and uh, so I think there's no one better than, than a local to do that. I have, like, a, I think an advantage there. I can speak with my own people, say, wow, you have to save this animal. She's been working at the field center since 2008 with the backing of the Houston Zoo. It's not only money, it's about exchange the, the skills. It's quite special, actually. Late in the afternoon on our first full day at the field center, our team from the zoo and Channel 2 boarded a boat, hoping to learn more about this rare subspecies known as the Asian pygmy elephant. The elephants, which are slightly smaller than the Asian elephants you'd see at the zoo, have been known to wander right by the field center. They can often be spotted near the river. We're hoping with a little luck and Farina's guidance, they'd be easy to find. Explain to us exactly how you track the elephants and where this comes into play here. So this thing here, it can detect uh, the radio from the satellite, from the collar of the elephants. GPS collars placed on some of the elephants help her follow the herds. The device Farina holds will beep if the elephants are near. We also look for trampled grass and other signs of elephant activity. The footprints, 
um, and the sounds of the elephants. So. <laughs> That's kind of a dead yeah. giveaway, isn't it? <laughs> right, so I don't hear them here. It's estimated there are only 1,500 Bornean pygmy elephants left. The species is poached for its tusks. Others killed just for passing through one of Borneo's many palm oil plantations. An elephant migrates through your crops. That, that's a problem. A solution is what Farina is trying to find as she treks into the jungle to study the elephant's habits and movement. Farina, we are headed in to go find the elephant. I think I can see some uh, fresh feeding signs here. Okay. I can't detect them yet with this uh, rear chef, so we're going to track a bit. So we're on the right track. Yes, hopefully, yeah. All right, yeah, let's yeah. go. Yeah. Farina easily glides through the dense brush in the deep mud. Not much traction in these. Well, we walked with a bit more caution. We spotted signs of elephants, but could not get close. We don't want to, you know, get stuck in the in the swamp. So I think the best right now is we heading back to the boat. That's and probably a good idea too, because I've got two holes in my boots. And my feet are very wet right now. So raising feet and no elephants. No elephants yet. Back. Yes. yet. With that. We began the journey back to the field center again, not seeing one of the island's most endangered animals yet, but appreciating even more this complex rainforest and river. Have you ever wanted to live anywhere else for a little bit? No. My country needs me. Getting locals involved is critical to saving wildlife. I saw it in Madagascar, and I know you saw it, Andy, when you traveled with the zoo to Rwanda. It definitely helps. Justin witnessed the zoo's work at both the Donagarang Field Center and at another spot along the Kinabatangan River, where efforts are underway to save Borneo's great apes. Hutan means forest, and orang means people. Orangutan means people of the forest. Borneo's only great ape and closest related animal to man is dying off in staggering numbers. The population cut in half in just a matter of years. Orangutans are declining fast, but it's not too late. This is the Kinabatangan Wildlife Sanctuary. It's home to dozens of Bornean orangutans. Now, they're a critically endangered species, and here's the problem. In other parts of this region, they're losing their home. One of the major threats to orangutan uh, survival is hunting. Hunting for two reasons. In some places, people still eat orangutan meat, and of course, in some other areas, when there is conflict between people and orangutans, sometimes animals get shot. Just like the elephants, conflict comes because orangutans are losing their forest to logging and palm oil plantations. Mark Ankranaz co-founded Hutan KOCP in the 1990s. KOCP stands for the Kinabatangan Orangutan Conservation Program. His team's mission is to save the forest and make sure the people and animals can coexist. This is what Hutan is doing, and I do believe this is achievable. Hutan employs about 65 local workers. Only if local people are empowered to do the work, we will be able to make a difference. Locals like Miss Lynn. Miss Lynn spends her days watching quietly, observing orangutans in her natural habitat. Above us on this day, a mother orangutan named Jenny and her youngest offspring. Jenny's believed to be over 50 years old, was the first orangutan observed in Lot 2. Almost 20 years we've been with this family. Orangutans can live up to 60 years. Miss Lynn tells us 25 orangutans under her watch have names. One is her favorite. Otai. He helping us, I think. How so? She tells us the story of the day Otai made a big commotion. A very noisy thing, screaming something like, and going up and down, up and down, and try to looking at us and try to pointing something using his eye. Yeah. And finally, we know that because we follow his eyes, mm -hmm. there is a big snake very close to us, like three meters something. Wow. Pythons. So... so maybe he was warning you. He tried warning us. That's what happened. Yeah. Ota is one of my favorite. That would be mine too if he, if he was going <laughs> to yeah. save me from a python. <laughs> Orangutans are smart, said to be observant. And in 2011, researchers determined they share 97% of their DNA sequence with humans. It would be so sad to lose one of our closest relatives. They can help our country, they can help our people. Orangutans and other primates eat the fruit off native trees and help disperse the seeds. They also bring in tourism dollars, another important source of income for locals. Doesn't matter if you are local, if you are city people, if you are from outside. We need to work together. The Houston Zoo has been helping Hutan make an impact since 2004 through money and other resources. 
Thank you very, very much, 100 million times to Houston Zoo. Ms. Lynn says as many as 35 orangutans live in Lot 2, which covers about three square miles of the sanctuary. Back at the field center, we were told orangutan sightings are more rare, making encounters even more special. So we were in the middle of doing an interview and somebody said we had an orangutan that's here at the center. It's actually up in one of the trees right here. Incredible. A mother and new baby, a sign of hope for the species and the forest, and a reminder of what the Houston Zoo and its conservation partners want all of us to save. I just want to make sure this species or orangutan stay long forever. My friends, come and let's work together. Working together to save animals and trees from the middle of the jungle. We need it for food, for, for breathing. And uh, without forests, I don't know what's going to happen. Still ahead, how one professor turned an abandoned building into a home for conservationists from around the world. Plus... It's not an easy animal to uh, work with, you know, in terms of how people perceive them. Setting out to catch an animal with a killer reputation. But first, the clouded leopard is another animal whose population is declining in Borneo. These secretive hunters have been spotted on camera traps set up by the Donagarang Field Center. Here at the Houston Zoo, you can get a closer look at these excellent climbers who can run head first down trees. Every trip here helps give the clouded leopard a better shot at surviving in the wild. We'll have much more when saving wildlife from Houston to Borneo continues next. We learned early that there are a lot of risks when you live or work in the jungle. Ryan Draper from the Houston Zoo team bailed us out when our boat began filling with water on our very first night in Borneo. Another night, we ran out of fuel. That's first. <laughs> Since a boat seat isn't an effective paddle, we sat and waited until help arrived. <laughs> then there's dangerous insects and leeches, bloodsuckers that sense your body heat and latch on. They're everywhere in the forest, and occasionally even come after you in the shower. While those guys are small threats, Borneo is also home to one of the most fierce, most dangerous animals in the world. The largest predator on this island, the saltwater crocodile. Okay, we're here with Krisha down by the docks. So tell us what we're gonna be doing with these rather massive looking traps here, Krisha. We're gonna head upstream and set the traps um, on both sides of a man-made bridge and um, Hopefully we're going to catch some massive crocs. The idea is to test if um, the crocs actually cross under the bridge because there are some theories that say they don't. So this is going to be the first start of my project. With traps, each nearly as large as the boat they were on, we headed out. <laughs> Following Carisha, Nataya and her crew. She's just taken over the croc project at the field center and is working with the state government. While the crocodiles aren't endangered, conflict causes them to be killed. There's a lot of human-wildlife conflict between crocodiles and people. And development, like the bridge, may be splitting up populations. Carisha's work may prove what previous researchers have suspected. They literally saw a crop swimming this way, and then he goes underwater and he goes back. So, yeah. so th know. this may act as a barrier because yeah. it's annoying. Yeah. With the help of some veteran members of the DGFC team, they found a good spot for the first trap. Concealed, secure, and with a clear area on shore nearby to help place a GPS tag on the animal if they're lucky enough to snag a large enough croc. Okay, yeah, so we're just dropping this one here and we're going to bait it on the way back. On the other side of the bridge, another solid point to drop the second trap. You tie there and then we're going to tie here as well. And the bait. Getting dirty for science. I, I was going to say, do did they, did they tell you this in school? <laughs> It takes more than guts to do Chris's job. It takes determination, patience, and the right tools. So explain to us how the trap works. That rope there is attached to the chicken guts, you know? And then what happens is the croc will enter, and as soon as it grabs that, this trap, the door shuts closed. Now we're just gonna hide it, kind of camouflage it. Yeah, and hopefully we catch a croc in the next two days. Carisha hopes to tag, then release at least five crocodiles she can follow for her research. If that theory um, is proven to be right, then we would know that a, a massive landscape, man-made landscape like this, is interrupting their movement. And from there, we can proceed and see what kind of management plans we can implement um, to, see, to help them move across more easily. 
I really, really hope I can make a change. Carisha says her family fully supports her. My parents are really proud of me, yeah. In spite of the danger. You know, I'm sure your mom has told you don't get eaten by a croc. <laughs> yeah, my, my dad has told me that as well. <laughs> <laughs> While catching a croc may not be up your alley, you can contribute to conservation efforts around the globe by spending a day at the Houston Zoo with your family. Money raised from zoo memberships, daily ticket prices, even gift shop purchases help the zoo support conservation programs from Asia to Africa to Latin America and even right here in Texas. In Borneo, the Donagarang Field Center is one of the zoo's longest and most successful partners. And it all started uh, with the elephants. And then we increased uh, the number of species in proboscis monkey, monitor lizard, python, pangolin, slow loris, and tarsier, civet, clouded lopar, sun bear. It's quite a lot. Yeah, it is, yeah. We just started a project on wild pigs also. That's now, but almost 20 years ago, Benoit Goosens was focused on orangutans when he made a find that would change his life and inspire new generations of conservationists. When did you first start doing research out here in, in the jungle? I started doing my research in 99. Uh, I was uh, sampling along the river, uh, orangutan uh, samples, and then uh, I found this in the middle of the forest. It was um, kind of abandoned. The buildings belong to the Saba Wildlife Department. I asked them uh, whether uh, they would be interested to set up a research center and use this place. And I say, yeah, no problem. I mean, if you can find the money for that, you can use it. Benoit works for Cardiff University in Wales, so he turned there to ask for money. He got it. The center was refurbished, boats and equipment were purchased. Then in 2008, the Donogarang Field Center opened. Peter met with Benoit, then the zoo quickly got behind the project. Four of my PhD students uh, were fully supported by, by Houston Zoo with scholarships, and two were locals, one British and one American. Beautiful day for the zoo. A portion of money brought in by the Houston Zoo guest still helps fund research and provides much needed equipment. So anything that we need to, uh, to bring uh, is, is by boat, including food, fuel, everything. Uh, so it's quite costly. Despite the challenges of working in the middle of a rainforest, Benoit takes great pride in the center. That's the library uh, where we have all our books, uh, all our field guides. There's an office for his PhD students and one for the short-term students. Uh, here you have Luke and uh, Aaron and uh, Alex, Jasmine. They are all uh, professional uh, training years, so they stay here for, for one year. Borneo in general is such an amazing place to be. So I changed degrees to do biology so I could do more stuff like this. There's a common area where meals are shared. Do you have an idea why they come along the river? And ideas about conservation develop. Okay, so I want to see your proposals within a week. A small lab holds the tools this team needs to advance their research. Microscopes and uh, all our camera traps are stored here. With the closest village 40 minutes away, families of the field center staff live on site. Kids are running around and uh, in, in, in this building. And uh, well, that makes the, the center very lively. We get the sense here that Ben has created a sense of community. Yeah, no, absolutely, that's true. And and he, he refers it to the, the Dano Yorang family. Mm -hmm. um, it's not they're not just a set of researchers. Like, like I said, we are, a, yes. we are a family. Benoit started his own family in recent years, marrying a fellow researcher and having a son. Uh, the first time he came in the jungle, he was six months old. What does it mean to you as a father to, to pass on that passion? For me, it's very important. It's because I really want this place and, and all wildlife to to be here for the next generations. Still ahead, why one of Borneo's most unusual animals is also the most trafficked mammal in the world. The thing that the scales, the blood, the, the meat give them some, you know, power. Plus, Whoa. a first encounter with elephants doesn't quite go as expected. They're not really, really not happy when they hear it. And next, let's go get our croc. A milestone in a young researcher's work on the island. But first, meet two more women who are saving wildlife in Borneo. 
Megan Harris Evans is an American researcher sponsored by the Houston Zoo at the Donagarang Field Center. She's been studying small carnivores and working with animals like clouded leopards, civets, and otters. The zoo has also supported UK scientist Penny Gardner, who monitors a species of wild cow known as Bantang. Bantang are shy animals, rarely seen, and at the top of the list of animals nearing extinction in Borneo. Gardner is developing a conservation action plan to hopefully save the Bantang tank before it's too late. We'll be back with more Saving Wildlife from Houston to Borneo next. Since its beginning in 1922, the Houston Zoo has grown from just a couple of acres to more than 55 acres with more than 6,000 animals. The zoo recently revealed plans to complete several new multi-species habitats before its centennial anniversary in 2022. Everything done here is to inspire guests to develop a love for animals and hopefully a passion to save them. After all, the more people that visit, the more help the zoo can offer conservation partners. And that's important because saving wildlife in Borneo is no small task. The island is bigger than Texas. And even with all that space, man and wildlife can sometimes find themselves too close for comfort. And when that happens, Justin found out, you need to have an escape plan. They're not happy. They're not happy and they know we are here. We're trying to figure out now the exit plan if we needed to, you know, they, they charge us. By the sound of that, you know we found elephants. If we approach them and we keep pushing them, I'm sure, it, you know, something not good is going to happen. Before we move forward, let's first back up to where we began the day in the Danogarang Field Center office. These all small dots here is um, representing the location of the elephants. Plotting our course to see Borneo's pygmy elephants. So this is uh, Girang's family group, and then this is Girang. Farina shows us pictures of the elephants she tracks and describes what it takes to put a GPS collar on an elephant. They use a tranquilizer to get the animal to slow down. She just stands there. Yeah. And then? And everyone here knows what they should do. Like these two guys, they know straight away that they have to work on to put the collar. Mm -hmm. And the other will take the, uh, the blood samples. Uh, I'll do the measurements. Uh, we have a veterinarian who always uh, watch her heartbeat and also the eyes, make sure that it's not dry. So you, it's take like maybe 10 minutes, the whole process. Wow. Farina says they get data from the GPS collars every two hours. Each color representing different elephants. Today the, the elephant position was here. Okay. So that's from this morning. From this morning. Okay. So we will try to go from here to here. It's about 500 uh, meter. So we will try to walk. Just about a third of a mile, not far, if the elephants stay put. Farina warns this day's trek may be more difficult than our first. It's like bushes, but very thick bushes that you have to like, oh, oh something Get through. like that. Yeah. All right. It's not uh, easy for the elephants, and certainly will not be easy for us because, <laughs> yeah. Do you have a machete? Uh, I don't, but if we need one today, yeah. we should probably find one. <laughs> find one. We again hiked through mud and dense brush. We've already seen a couple of dung piles. Seem fairly fresh, which is good from what Farina's saying. And check this out, best sign we've seen so far. These big holes, these are elephant tracks. Let's keep going. We found a bit of a clearing, and Coco and Ryan heard right. some of the elephants back down that way. Mm -hmm. and we're not picking up any signals. No. So this may not be necessarily Garang. Right. This could be a different set. Yep. As we got closer, the elephants got louder. I will wait a bit, let them feel relaxed. And then once there is no more calling or noise like this, then we'll try to approach them again. Despite the name, pygmy elephants can still weigh more than five tons. Even through the thick forest, we can see and hear that we have to be careful. After several minutes, things got quiet. And they are now currently resting, so we don't want to disturb their natural behavior. We have to respect them now. As much as conservationists try not to interfere with animals in their natural habitat, sometimes an intervention is what's needed to save a species from extinction. Species survival programs allow certified zoos to raise and breed certain endangered wildlife with the goal of eventually releasing them back into the wild. 
In Texas, the Houston Zoo released 61 Atwaters prairie chickens and 900,000 Houston toad eggs last year alone. Unfortunately, this isn't a solution for one of Borneo's most mysterious animals. It's an animal with survival needs that can't be met by man. And yet, it has still become the most wanted mammal in the world. <laughs> Alyssa Pangjong may have one of the I toughest jobs in Borneo. She's working to study and save an animal that's elusive, yet trafficked more than any other mammal on the planet. I'm also not only a student, but also a saba. Um, honorary wildlife warden, so I have to compete with the hunters, the poachers, to do this research. Alyssa is researching the pangolin, a creature many Texans would think looks very similar to an armadillo. An ecosystem engineer, an, an ants exterminator, and then also a soil caretaker. That's what I define a pangolin. So why would an animal many have never heard of also be the most sought-after mammal in the world? People poach for pangolin because of this superstitious they think that the scales, the blood, the, the meat give them some, you know, power that can cure many diseases, but it's not proven scientifically. The animals are trafficked to China and the United States more than any other countries. Since pangolins are nocturnal, Alyssa took us out on a walk at night through the forest. While a lot of animals can be spotted after dark, the pangolin is mysterious and not easily seen. The last one that you actually tagged was one that was captured by a, a guy that used to hunt them. He used to be a hunter, yeah. and then he wants to surrender this pangolin to me. I feel really happy because there's a change of mindset here. There are estimates 10,000 pangolins are captured and sold illegally every year. It's not known how many are left in the wild, but there's no question these animals with a coat of armor are one of the most vulnerable creatures anywhere. The first time my supervisor told me that your project is funded by Houston Zoo. I was so happy. The Houston Zoo selected Alyssa to receive the 2017 Wildlife Warrior Award. She's really, really good with people and with um, children and adults alike. The award recognizes exceptional individuals doing work with the zoo's conservation partners. At nighttime, she's looking for pangolins, but during the day, she's speaking to villages, she's speaking to people on the river, she's speaking at schools. That's where we need to concentrate, do more um, Conservation education. We we don't stop. We just yeah. do it what what we do. And we need everybody's help to do Correct. it as well. Yes, absolutely. Not endangered, but still one of the important pieces in the conservation puzzle in Borneo is the reticulated python, considered to be one of the largest snake species in the world. They can top 25 feet long and have a lot of power. In spite of that, when Justin was asked if he wanted to go catch one at night, he didn't hesitate. He jumped right on board. Snake boat. All right, Rich, so we're headed out. Snake boat. We've got yeah. quite a crowd with us tonight. This is this. I've, I've heard at the uh, center this is one of the most uh, popular things. Everybody loves coming out, looking uh, for pythons at night. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Fun is not the reason Rich goes out night after night. It's important to sort of study these animals because they, they tend to be really overlooked. They feed on the majority of the species that are, that are here, and a lot of those are endangered. Rich is trying to paint a picture of the entire ecosystem. His work began during a brief visit to the Donogarang Field Center in 2009. Benoit recognized Rich's interest in snakes and kept in touch with him, eventually drawing the student back to the jungle to make history in the field of reptile research. To be the, the first person to GPS tag a reticulated python is, is pretty cool. Rich tagged a python to track its movements and hopefully understand how development is cutting off python populations and their prey around the island. <laughs> On this night, Snake Boat launched with our Houston team on board. We set out looking for the shimmering scales of a snake, the glow of the python's eyes. We looked and looked. And as the moon rose higher in the night sky, Rich and his team spotted a variety of animals along the shore. We've got a little crocodile there, by the way. Oh, yeah. A little tiny guy. A little heron but still no snake. It looked as if Snake Boat would be returning to the dock without its namesake, but then... So it's quite low down. Rich so spots something in the tall quickly. grass. Okay, go, 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 go. Oh, okay, I'm almost falling off. Okay, there we go. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay? Yeah, yeah, that's what we want. Okay. <coughs> to fly. <laughs> All right, there we go. 
one small reticulated python. So before I put this one in the bag, I just want to check and see whether it's got any feces. Samples are needed to test for parasites and DNA of the snake's prey. Sure. Tomorrow afternoon, we'll, uh, <clears throat> we'll measure this guy and then, um, then release him back here. How on earth did you spot him? A lot of practice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys. If you the next day at the field it, center, it's going to take some head measurements. It's time to measure the python and check it for a microchip. Uh huh. It's a recapture. Okay, fine. This is a snake Rich has nabbed before. That's helpful in recording the animal's growth and movement. Dash 07 AD. So I'm just removing ticks. He helps the python by carefully removing ticks from its body. Pythons have. Uh, Heat sensitive pits along the, the top of their, their mouth and actually on the bottom jaw as well, which are able to sense uh, infrared radiation. And ticks quite often get into those. So I'm doing this guy a big favor here. So in the bag tail first. As Rich gets ready to return this python back to where he found it, he also prepares for another night of work, made just a bit easier thanks to the Houston Zoo. Those bright headlamps his team wears on snake boat were provided by our zoo. Houston Zoo has been incredibly generous to this place, and you know I think we all uh, really appreciate that. Still ahead. I believe it was fighting a good fight. Um, it was a big victory for conservation. Big wins for life in Borneo, plus a rare glimpse inside a palm oil plantation. So this is the entrance to the plantation. Yep. As our team tries one last time to find elephants on the island. And you want me to say to the camera that men are useless? <laughs> Why women, more than men, are being hired to restore Borneo's forests. But first, at the orangutan habitat at the Houston Zoo, you'll find another animal native to Borneo. The painted terrapin is one of the most endangered river turtles in Southeast Asia. During mating season, the male's head becomes white and a red stripe develops between its eyes, making it look painted. More of Borneo's most interesting animals next on Saving Wildlife from Houston to Borneo. Everywhere you turn on this island, there are signs of the biggest booming business in Borneo. Just ahead, above the natural vegetation on the banks of the Kinabatangan, are palm trees. Now, palm oil plantations are a tricky thing here. It's a productive crop, so it brings in income for families. But when it starts to encroach upon the river, the cost can be devastating. Since palm oil is in such high demand, growers are always looking for more land to develop. There are estimates less than a third of Borneo's native forests will be left in just a few years. Oil palms are different than the palm trees that we see in Texas or the coconut palms found in California and Florida. Oil palms flourish in Malaysia because of the rich soil and the tropical climate. The red fruit they produce is what brings in all the green. The fruit that generates the oil replenishes quickly after being picked. By all accounts, this is a good crop to grow, but it has to be done responsibly, and that's where conservation groups are stepping in to help. An organization called the Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil, or RSPO, works with the palm oil industry to make sure the product is produced without impacting wildlife. If the oil palm industry is well managed, orangutan can adapt and can survive in this new mosaic landscape. Now, palm oil is in things we use every day. Cosmetics, soap, shampoos, and it's in a lot of the food we eat. Trying to avoid it isn't the solution. Replacement crops would take more space and cut into wildlife's habitat even more. So what can you do? As a consumer living in Houston, for example, buying, purchasing products that are certified by RSPO will help to promote better practices and actually will help securing a future for the forest and for orangutan. Being an informed consumer is an important first step. The next time you're out grocery shopping, check the labels to learn how many of the products you buy contain palm oil. The Houston Zoo also has a form online you can use to easily contact some of the biggest companies to let them know it's important to you that they only use sustainable palm oil. As we've shown you, without sustainable palm oil, many of Borneo's animals would disappear forever. That includes the pygmy elephants, which are already becoming harder and harder to see. So what is missing for your plot, for the story? 
elephants. elephants. <laughs> That's it. Yep. After several days of searching for the critically endangered pygmy elephants, only spotting them through thick vegetation in the jungle, we thought our Houston crew might be returning home without getting a clear look at the animals the zoo is working to help save. We would get one last chance. So this is the entrance to the plantation. Yep. Plantations, for the most part, are off-limits to conservationists and TV crews. Farina, Mark, and Peter worked together to get us permission to enter this massive property. After driving deep into the plantation, we began to walk. And that's when we spotted them. Several elephants, a complete family group, calmly moving through the trees. An incredible sight as we watched them eat and interact, knowing the species could be on a path to extinction. In Borneo, elephants have no natural predators. Currents are the biggest danger to the little ones when herds swim across the river. But on land, people are the biggest threat to this wild population. In 2013, a baby was saved after 14 other elephants were poisoned for interfering with crops on a plantation. We have to find a solution where people can still tolerate the loss, but at the same time, elephants can still survive. Farina's been focused on studying elephants in the forest. Now, she'll spend more time observing them in the plantations. She says there are ways to stop elephants from causing damage to crops without killing them. Things like noise-making cannons and electric fences. We cannot totally eliminate conflicts, but we can reduce it. While the true impact of Farina's work may take years to see, there are several wins conservation teams in Borneo can already celebrate. There was this project of, uh, of building another, a new bridge across the Kinabatangan. We have already one bridge uh, that was built in the 1990s, and that already uh, split the populations of, of elephants, proboscis monkey, orangutan. Benoit Goussin said he provided scientific facts stating a second bridge would disrupt wildlife even more and increase conflict between the animals and people. And so I went against the local uh, politician there and also some of the members of the local community, so it was a bit, uh, a bit tense. Tense, but effective. One year ago, the chief minister of Sabah scrapped plans to build the bridge. But Benoit says the fight is not over. We need to look after this place. I mean, there's too much fragmentation on happening. Fragmentation that's also had a significant impact on orangutans. One of the biggest problems with the large trees being chopped down here across the tributaries of the Kinabatangan is that the orangutans can't cross. Hutan recognized this issue and developed a solution. Suspending ropes across the water gives the great apes and other primates a way to travel from forest to forest. Another win, getting more locals involved in conservation. Including Eddie Ahmad, who once worked as a timber logger. Uh, I have slowly uh, developed the love for nature, and then uh, I feel very sad that uh, people are cutting down the trees. Eddie now is involved in a carnivore research project for Hutan and serves in the Wildlife Survey and Protection Unit to try to stop poachers. He's also one of the Houston Zoo's wildlife warriors from 2016. As for land that's been turned back over by plantation owners, there's an effort to regrow at least some of what's been lost. And it's happening from the ground up. Down a dirt path, we were led to a field alongside a palm plantation. This plot of land, once towering with palms, has been cleared and is now being restored one native tree at a time. It's actually a very tough work, very tedious, especially the maintenance part of it, where people have to take care of every single seedlings one by one. A dedicated team of workers transforms the landscape back to its original state. The workers here have one thing in common. Why use all women team? What's the advantage? Dr. Mark Ankrenaz from Hutan says he started this project with a team of men. They were able to do the work properly, except that they were not able to care enough for the young seedlings. So our survival rate was not that great. So we, start, we changed our approach, and we started a new team using women, and we found out that the difference is huge. I think somehow women are more able to care for every single individual tree. Mariana Singong understands her job benefits more than just Borneo. We help the earth about the oxygen. She's doing it for future generations, including her own family. Yes, I'm a mother. I have 10 children, and I have 13 grandchildren. The former plantation property where we met Mariana divides two sections of forest. 
Bhutan hopes its work will allow animal populations to cross freely again. The reforestation effort begins in a greenhouse. When the time and the size is right, these native trees are transplanted to the fields. And that's when the hard work begins. This mom and grandmother wears a heavy coat to protect her skin from the sun and rough brush. They work quickly, maintaining six different lots across more than 33 acres. The last year we planted 30,000. Wow. Uh, and this year, 15,000. It's a lot of trees. It's a big project, getting support from Houstonians. The support originating from Houston Zoo is used to pay for salaries or equipment that we need to have our different units running. After seeing how quickly the women work to plant each tree... Around the stick. Around the stick, okay. They let me dig in and give it a try. Oh, no, 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 oh, no, oh. no. I'm gonna take oh, that. Okay. okay. We won't say just how long it took me. <laughs> One down, about 30,000 to go. Still ahead, a real example of the danger of an iconic species being wiped out. They couldn't breathe anymore. It was too late. Their numbers were too low. So we're watching the extinction of yeah. the species. And next. I feel glad that I can be a role, role model to my daughter. The women of Borneo serving as role models for future generations. So I'm glad I'm, I'm going to be part of it. <laughs> but first, there's a harmony of sounds in the rainforest created by birds, bugs, and a wide array of amphibians, including this. This is a Bornean eared frog. You can see her here at the Houston Zoo. They have distinct bony ridges behind their eye and ear area. Unfortunately, populations of these frogs are also declining in the wild. Saving wildlife from Houston to Borneo will be right back. In Borneo, time is already up for one of the world's most iconic animals. The Bornean subspecies of the Sumatran rhino is down to its last few animals. The very sad stories that happened to the rhinoceros should be a wake-up call. Hunting and habitat loss led to the demise of these rhinos. And if action is not taken quickly enough, more species could disappear too. Conservationists have to yell louder when they feel that there's a problem. I mean, what's next? When all these big species, especially uh, great apes, will be gone, what's next? We have what we have left. Let's protect what we have left and keep that from happening. Inspiring others to protect what's left is exactly what Farina is doing, starting with her own daughter. One of her teachers sent me a text said, you know what, how your uh, daughter described you? She said that you are Dr. Elephant. <laughs> <laughs> so my mom is Dr. Elephant. Farina recently finished her PhD and is taking steps to create her own conservation project. And we're very proud that she's worked her way through her PhD and all these years through her program. And we're just happy that she's been part of our Houston Zoo family for so long. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Farina proudly represents the Houston Zoo and sets an example for other young conservationists, like Alyssa. She is our role model, yeah. She is someone that we want to, to be. I am a pangolin researcher. During a recent visit to the Houston Zoo, Alyssa taught Texans about the animals she's fighting to save. For armadillo, they only have one big plate to protect the body. For pangolin, they have 900 to 1,000 scales. Saving wildlife bracelets sold at the zoo helps support wildlife warriors. Because I'm a wildlife warrior selected by this Houston Zoo staff, people listen to me more. So it is amazing to be here. I'm putting in a microchip. Back in Borneo, the women we met say the work is just beginning, and they hope others will get on board to save wildlife. We have to take lead and to learn and to take responsible of what we have. Be brave. Try to follow your dreams. For women around the world, Join us in the consolation. There are so many ways you can join the fight to save wildlife, starting with coming to the zoo. The Houston Zoo also has six take action initiatives that you can take on with your family, including paper and electronics recycling and shopping for sustainable seafood and palm oil. To learn more about all the initiatives and to take a look back at our previous conservation journeys with the Houston Zoo, log on to the community page of click2houston.com. We leave you tonight with a look at more of Borneo's beauty, including a pair of horned bill birds that visited a local village on our crew's last day on the island. Thank you for joining us, and thanks to all of you and the Houston Zoo for doing so much to save wildlife around the world. Good night.
first of all, I would like to say thank you very much to Gibson Zoo. We really need this. Without your help, a lot of things can't be done here. Everyone can contribute to make a difference. Thank you very, very much for Houston Group.